Now, for some of you, and I don't know, do you have any envelopes left out so you gave them all out? Giving records for those uh, people? I got only two left. Yeah, there's a couple giving records, and you can see my wife about that. If they're not back there, they were mailed out Friday. And so you will get, if you gave anything, uh, we have we have to you know, give you a giving record. And if you want to get credit for your giving, then fill out an envelope, and, uh, and that will make sure that you get your returns and you can file those on your tax because we are a not-for-profit organization. We are a legal church filed with the state of Colorado, praise the Lord. Now, those of you here, you can turn to Psalm 103. And Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for Jesus. Let Jesus be exalted and glorified in this place. Let every person be changed by the power of the word of God in Jesus' name. Now, we started last week doing it his course, we're going to do a series on Psalm 103. And we said that the Psalms are books of, as a book, or books, actually there's four books, it's books of praise, praises, or, pr or prayers in praise. Song was added to these prayers. Now, what they state are definite facts about God at that time through the revelation of of the psalmists, the Old Testament writers that had a revelation of God. David was one of them, wrote many of the psalms, but not all of them. Moses was also an author of some of the psalms, and there were other, other writers also. But what they were revealing to us was their revelation of Almighty God, their relationship to them, and many of the psalms talk about their uh, workings with the Lord, of being in the wilderness with Him, and God coming through for them. And uh, so we can learn a lot of things. And I said this last week that half of the New Testament writers, when they quoted the Old Testament, half of that teaching was from the Psalms. And so there's much in there. There's much in there about the Messiah, about Jesus. There's Messianic Psalms. A lot of it gives us more uh, revelation of what even the New Testament is. You don't have much revelation in the New Testament about uh, crucifixion, of what Jesus went through at the cross at Calvary. But you'll find that in Psalms, in particular Psalm 22, you will find that of a lot of revelation about Jesus. And so Again, what our, our praise and worship today, there's not much in the church today about praise and worship, but most of our praise and worship today, playing of instruments, raising our voice, lifting our hands, clapping our hands, dancing, that all comes from the Psalms. And it's okay, it's good, amen? And so we're studying this through the, through the Psalms, and we said this, that the Psalms, but really any scripture, any time that you take a fact in the Word of God and you pray that back to Him or worship Him back through that psalm, through that prayer, through the Word of God, that's basically what prayer is. You are acknowledging, and that is a way of you acknowledging and releasing your faith to the Lord and acknowledging that His Word is true and that He is actively working in your life. So rather than continually bombarding heaven with continuous and repetition prayers, Rather than continuing to fight devils over and over and over again, rather than continue to confess over and over and over again, to move God, to try to just you know, make your ten confessions a day so that you know, you'll be protected, you know, make your petition. Find out what the Word of God says about your situation. If you acknowledge that it is the enemy that is in there, command him to go in the name of Jesus. If you see a promise in the Word of God or a fact in the Word of God, it doesn't need to be prayed about. All it needs to do is be acknowledged. All it needs to do is be acted upon. How do you act upon that? Well, just lift your hands and begin to thank and praise the Lord. Amen? See, the Bible says, by His stripes, I was healed. See, God's not going to heal me. I don't have to get God to heal me. By His stripes, I was healed. That, that is a fact of something that Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. Okay, how do I appropriate that? In the name of Jesus, Father, I just thank you. I just praise you that your word says that at the cross of Calvary, you took my infirmities and you bore my sicknesses. So right now, I just say the sickness and disease go, and now I thank you. And I just praise you in Jesus' name that by your grace and by your mercy and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I am healed now. And that, that manifestation is coming. That manifestation is mine. Healing is mine. And the power of the Holy Spirit is working in my life. See that? You, you just turn everything into praise. You turn everything into thanksgiving. And when you do that, all of a sudden, the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, the joy returns. And when I see, I see a lot of Christians and they're very depressed, they're very downtrodden, they're very defeated, and God loves you, and there's nothing wrong with that. He's not mad at you, and you're not a bad Christian. But, you know, He wants you to be joyful. He wants you to be happy. You know, happy's not a bad thing. Well, I still those happy Christians... 
Either, oh, they're, they're just as happy as can be. I'm, I'm just disgusted with them. Or what do you want to be? Miserable and sourpuss all your life? Amen. I'd rather be happy and, 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 and glad than, than sad and mad. And so anyway, you know, the Psalms are a way of us expressing and acknowledging our faith in the Lord. So we started last week in Psalm 103, and it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now again, bless means to give thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. Bless the Lord. You know, we, we talk about the blessings of God and God blessing us, but did you know you can bless God? I mean, look, read the Psalms. You know, Psalm after Psalm, it says, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, or bless the Lord. I extol you, O Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Soul, praise the Lord. So David, his spirit man, is talking to his soul. And he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. So we said this also, that praise is more of a soulish thing, where worship is more spiritual. Worship is really the attitude of your heart towards the Lord 24-7, wherever you go. Praise is an expression out of your soul, and it's an acknowledgement. And what happens is, it gives honor to the Lord when you do that, and it refreshes your soul when you open your mouth and you begin to praise. How many of you this week, after last week, we said that take it about taking a praise break? How many of you did that this week? Praise God. How did it benefit you? Yes. Amen. Praise God. That, that's the way I live my life. I live my life just praising and thanking and worshiping God all the time. See, you don't have to be in church. You don't have to be any special place. You can wake up, praise the Lord. You can do it in the shower. You know, you can do it uh, You know, at a TV break if you're watching it. I mean, you know, we don't have to be religious about this whole thing. But it's just time to praise and worship God. And the worship, again, is an attitude of your spirit. And praise is more vocal and it's more exemplary. You know, where you're uh, demonstrative in, in your praise. So David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that was is within me. And that means with your whole being. The word in the Hebrew is the word kaol. And it means whole, any, any and every way, in all manner, and in all manner. To praise and bless the Lord. Uh, we've been in, in, in third world countries. I remember we, are, <clears throat> we used to go to Haiti a lot. And from 1990 to 1995, we frequented Haiti every year, once or twice a year. And we'd go there, and they'd take an old tub, you know, those wash tubs, and they'd turn them upside down. And that was, that was our music, you know, and they would sing songs and beat that tub. Yeah. And, it, and again, it wasn't demonic, it wasn't voodoo or anything. They were praising and worshiping the Lord. We were singing Christian songs, but it was just that was all the musical instruments that we had. So you can make a joyful noise to the Lord with anything. But David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that was in me, bless his holy name. And we talked about the name of the Lord being Yahweh. <laughs> Yahweh Elohim means the Lord God. And we went through all those names. We don't really need to know all those names. It's nice to know because they describe a character of God. El Olam, God is the everlasting one. El Elyon, Adonai, the Lord most high. Yahweh Yireh, the Lord my provider. Yahweh Sidkenu, my righteousness. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord my healer. All that, that's all good. But the name of Jesus, somebody say Jesus, is the name above every name. And no other name under heaven can men be saved except by the name of Jesus. That's Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. So all that God is... And every description of the Lord is wrapped up in the name of Jesus. And that is the name that is given to us, the church, to use on his behalf. And when you say Jesus, all heaven stops, all hell bows, all of the heavenly host backs you up. Every demon bows to the name of Jesus. And God does what he does because of the name of Jesus. You know, the scripture says this uh, in John chapter 1, I believe it's verse 12. It says, the many as, as, believe, as received him or believed on him, then then he gave the right... To become sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, talking about Jesus, shall be saved. So, so you know, we, we make salvation so hard. We make it so difficult. Well, you got to do this, this, and this. And then once you do this, then you have to exemplify this, this, and this. You have to act this way. You have to do this and stop doing this and stop doing that. That's not what salvation is. It's a gift. It's the person of Jesus. Amen. So, so here's a gift for you, brother. Praise the Lord. How hard was that to receive that gift? You got a gift for me? There you go. Praise the Lord. He just gave me this gift right back. See how easy it is to receive that gift? How easy is it to get born again? How easy is it to receive Jesus? Remember, uh, Philip was on the road, and there and he saw the Ethiopian eunuch, and he was reading Isaiah, and he jumped up there. And he said, you know what you're reading? The Spirit said, go up and talk to this man. And he said, you know what you're reading? He said, no, how can I know what I'm reading? Except somebody explained it to me. 
So he, he starts to expound to him about Jesus. So they go a little ways and he says, uh, here's some water. He says, what forbids me to be baptized? He said, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, he said, I believe that. He said, okay, I'll baptize you. You're saved. Now that would not flow in the legalistic church today. <laughs> Amen. That, that, would, that the people would have a real hard problem. Now I understand you have to really believe that in your heart. But listen, that's the only stipulation is that you believe in your heart. Amen. And confess with your mouth. All the actions that come after that, you know, again, <laughs> that, that doesn't make you any more or any less saved. I just made a whole bunch of legalists mad. You know, so people go to church and say, well, you can't really be saved because, you know, you do this and you can't really be saved because you don't do that. You know, if you were really saved, you know, you would do this. It's like, come on, friends, give me a break. You know? Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He's curious. And if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess him as curious, as God in the flesh, then you're saved. That's what the Bible says. And so David is blessing the Lord. Now he says this, he says, forget not his benefits. And those word benefits means his treatment, that which he has given, rewards or gifts by grace. So why don't New Testament Christians experience the goodness, the gifts of God, the abundance of gratuity of the things that God has for them? Because they're trying to earn it. They're trying to be good enough. They're trying to meet all of these standards of what people have put on their life. And everything is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Justification by faith is a gift. Sanctification is a gift. Your redemption is a gift. Healing is a gift. Power is a gift. Authority is a gift. Faith is a gift. Love is a gift. And when we understand that, see, it's all by God's grace. His undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor. Anytime you see grace in the Bible, it's a gift. So everything that we are, everything that we have is now a gift. Why? Because Jesus paid for everything at the cross at Calvary. He did as a man, as a God man, what we could not do as human beings. We could not keep the law. How could we? We were born with a sinful nature. And that was God's aim. I'm going to talk to you about this this morning. See, what was God's aim? It was to change our nature. Friends, what does the church focus on today? It focuses on acts of sin. And all acts of sin are a result of a fallen nature or an unrenewed mind. And so what did we do? We went out to the streets. I didn't do this. You know, but you see Christians out in the streets. they got these big placards. And there might be a rally going on. And say, oh, you, you, you dirty, rotten sinners, you're all going to hell. You know, and if you don't stop doing this, you know, you're going to hell and all this stuff. And Jesus didn't do that. He went and, and, and preached. He told people to turn. Turn away from your own works. Because I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And I'm going to show you and demonstrate my Father's love for you by healing your body, not condemning you. John chapter 8, they bring a woman that is caught in the midst of adultery. And they said, Jesus, the law says, stone this woman. So Jesus stoops down, he writes on the ground. I don't know what he wrote, nobody, nobody knows what he wrote. He stands up, he says, all right, he is without sin be the first to cast a stone. And so one by one, they start to walk away. Nobody's left but Jesus and the woman. So she looks up. Jesus said, where's your accusers? She said, there's none there. Lord. He said, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. Now, I want to clarify this. He was not saying, say he was not saying. He was not saying, go and don't commit an act of sin anymore. Because it wasn't possible for her to do that because she was unsaved. And we are saved. <laughs> Can we still struggle? And we still haven't come to that place. So what was Jesus saying when he's saying, go and sin no more? He was saying, go and disbelieve in me no more. Because that's the only sin that stands between you and Almighty God. is the sin of unbelief, of not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're going to see today, why? Because all of your sins, past, present, and future, were taken care of by Jesus at the cross of Calvary. You know, it's amazing to me, even before Jesus went to the cross, brother, even before he went to the cross, when they lowered that man through the, through the roof in Luke chapter 5, and Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And they said, oh, who's this guy? Blaspheming, forgiving sins. Only God can forgive sins. That's right, because he was the God-man. He was forgiving sins even before he went to the cross. Not condemning people. Showing them His love and His mercy and His grace. 
Then Paul came along and he preached the gospel of grace and said, you know, this is Jesus. He's the one. Uh, if God did not spare His only begotten Son, Jesus, Romans 8.32, how said I also with Him freely? Say freely. Freely, freely give you all things. You know what they did? They stoned Him. They, 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 they beat Him with rods. They threw Him in prison for preaching the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God because He wasn't preaching the law. Praise God, it's a good thing we have a civilized society today because I would have been stoned a hundred times by now. <laughs> Robert and I and Randy and all of you, all of you grace preachers, you free grace preachers, y'all would have been stoned by now, y'all would have been put in prison by now. But praise God, we're not. And I'm telling you, this message of the gospel of grace is changing the world. Amen. And in, I, was, I said the next 10 years, but I'm telling you, in less than 10 years, this whole church, I'm telling you, the church is fed up with legalism. They're fed up with domination, control, and manipulation, intimidation. They want the truth. They want, they want to love God. They want to be free to love God and live for God without somebody dictating to them you know, every single thing that they do or how to do it or when to do it or how much to do it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And he says, forget not his benefits. So again, those benefits are his treatment, that which he has given rewards or gifts by grace. Verse 3 says, Who forgives or pardons all your iniquities. How many? Oh. All your iniquities. Now we have to define iniquities because people don't realize this. But in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you get an understanding of this. It mentions trespasses. It mentions sins. And it mentions iniquities. And it mentions them as different entities. So, what is a sin? A sin is missing the mark. A trespass is getting off of the path. What is an iniquity? Well, I have a definition of it right here. It's the word avon, avon, but it's spelled the same way you would say avon, no, avon calling. <laughs> it's avon, and it's the propensity to sin. It's a crooked way, listen, a rebellious nature and its consequences. And so what happens? We are all born with a rebellious nature. We are all born into iniquity. Not so much sin. We have a sinful nature. But that sinful nature is iniquity. We have a propensity to sin. You don't have to tell a three-year-old child, you know, to disobey. Eventually, sometime, that newborn baby, eventually, sometime, you know, as they grow up, they're going to have a mind of their own, and they're going to do something contrary to what's right and wrong. Contrary to moral and, 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 and moral principles. Amen? Why? Because it's inbred in their nature. Amen? They're born in iniquity. Now, they're sinless, but they're born into iniquity, and they have a propensity to sin. They're born with a sinful nature, a rebellious nature. And eventually, that rebellious nature will lead to consequences. Now, listen to the scripture in Psalm 51. This is the Psalm of David. In verse 2, David said this. He said, Wash me from my iniquity... And cleanse me from my sin. So even David designated and, and established that iniquity and sin were two different things. Verse 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So this is the condition of every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth. So well, well, I'm in a difficult situation. I'm in a horrible situation. Now wait a second. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 through 6 says this, But he was wounded for our transgressions. Right. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. New Testament says, 1 Peter 2, 24, By his stripes we were healed. Now verse 6 is the key. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone our own way. And the Lord has laid on him. God the Father has laid on Jesus the iniquity <coughs> of us all. Now that was a, a foretaste of what was to happen at the cross at Calvary. Old Testament saints, and before anybody is born again, is in iniquity. They have a sinful nature. Amen? And their acts of sin are a result, or their propensity to sin, is a result of their sinful nature, that iniquity, that fallen rebellious nature. You understand that? You understand that? But Jesus at the cross defeated that sinful nature. He did as the God-man what no man could do. And he became sin for us. He bore our iniquity. He bore, listen, that rebellious nature and the consequences of that. 
Now, again, Psalm 103 is an old covenant psalm. And in the old covenant, this is the psalm of David. He said, who forgives me of all my iniquities. He heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction and crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. It's old covenant. Now it's applicable for us today. See? But they still had a sinful nature. They still had a rebellious nature. They still had a propensity to sin. And sin still brings consequences, but the consequences are not from God. It's not punishment from God. In this psalm, in Psalm 103, if you go on in verse 10 and 11 there, it says that God is slow to anger. And He does not want to judge us according to our sins. He doesn't want to reward us according to our sins. But as far as the east is to the west, so far He has removed our sins from us. That's not us. That's Old Testament people. Is that right, John? You're checking me out? Am I right? Okay, I think I'm voting and I'm not looking there. That's Old Covenant people. So they had forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament. What did they not have? Even the propensity, even that fallen nature, God couldn't take that nature out. But He could deal with them according to His forgiveness of those sins. And He could deal with them according to His forgiveness of their iniquity, of their propensity to sin, of that rebellious nature, because of Jesus who had not yet gone to the cross of a word of prophecy. Think about this, friends. I don't know how many years that is, uh, Robert. Can you tell me from from Isaiah 53 all the way up to the cross? Is it a thousand years? Maybe more? 1,500 years? I don't know how many. But I mean, uh, hundreds of years. Let's say hundreds of years before Jesus even went to the cross. And they're reaping the benefits of Calvary of the risen Christ before they go to the cross. And God describes Himself as slow to anger, merciful, gracious, Loving kindness, goodness. That's the way he describes himself in the Old Testament. You know, God never wanted to punish anybody. But he had to show that sin was wrong. He had to show that there was a nature that needed to be changed. All with me. Mm-hmm. Well, so Isaiah chapter 53 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Friends, that was a promise for them. They were benefiting from that from that back then, but now for us it's a fact. It's a reality. Amen? Now, if you want to, you can turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. And this again is another Old Testament prophecy, but it's applicable to the New Testament. It fits us in our day. Of, of what is promised to us now, not a promise anymore, but now a fact. And this is a, a scripture that is quoted both in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 31, I believe it starts at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. So he's not talking about the, 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 the people of the day. He's talking about future, a new covenant. That's what we have, a new covenant, a new testament. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, not according to the old covenant, that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. Now watch. But this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel, After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now I've got to stop here for a moment. He's not talking about writing the Ten Commandments in our hearts as New Testament people. That's right. Why? Because the, the law of the Old Covenant brought condemnation. It magnified their sin. So why? I mean... You don't have to be a theologian, you have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. But why would God put an old covenant law that he abolished, an old covenant law that brought death, an old covenant law that brought condemnation, an old covenant law that brought judgment, why would he write that in a New Testament Christian's heart? He wouldn't, he didn't. He wrote in there a law of love. That's not the Bible saying in Romans 5, 5 that he has shed and brought in our hearts the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's the royal law of love. 
God would never tell a New Testament Christian after the whole New Testament says that all of that has been abolished. He would never tell a new Christian that I'm going to write that on your heart. So now every time you do something, now you're condemned. Every time you do something wrong, now death is going to come to you. That's, that's, that's not the New Testament. Amen? Yet Christians believe that. And that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the royal law of love. He talks about this and he says, I'm going to take out in Ezekiel. <clears throat> he says, I'm going to take out Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I'm going to take out that heart of stone. Well, where did they write the Ten Commandments? On tables of stone. He says, I'm going to take out the heart of stone and I'm going to replace it with a heart of flesh. A heart of feeling. A heart that has compassion. A heart that can experience the love of God. Amen. So let's go on here. Just read a, a couple more verses here up to verse 34. And after these days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. It will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall teach no more. Every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their, and I will remember their sins no more. Now that says that's the exact same thing. It says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. It quotes Isaiah chapter 31, these verses, and it's applying it to New Testament Christians. The letter to the Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians that were struggling between law and grace. So Paul, I believe Paul was the writer of Hebrews. If you believe it was somebody else, it's okay. You know, we can all still go to heaven. But he quotes this same scripture and he's emphasizing, as he says this, and we're going to read it later. He says, I did away with the old so that I could bring in the new and your sins and your iniquities. Well, I remember no more. Why doesn't he remember your sins or iniquities anymore? Because he put them on Jesus. Because Jesus bore the sins of the whole world. And he became sin for us so that now our nature is not a nature of iniquity anymore. Our nature is not a propensity to sin. Our nature is now a, a, a nature that loves God, that wants to, that loves the Word of God, that loves people, that wants to, to, to do good things. Amen? That wants to do wholesome and sound and, and immoral and ethical things. That's our nature now. Amen? So we need to yield to that nature that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Are you all with me this morning? Now, go over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And I want to say this to your friends. And we're talking about this, this benefit this morning. Okay, and we're supposed to praise and thank God for these benefits. And as we praise and thank God for these benefits, what happens? We experience them. See, they're fast. Actually, before you go there, go to Psalm 106. I want to show you something. Psalm 106. Now again, Old Covenant. But there's a principle here, and I want to show you this. Psalm 106, verse 6 says this. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Now, why did they do that? Well, they, that was their nature. But let me stop here for a moment. People that never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior still have free will. And if you read the first two chapters of Romans, you will see God coming strong against unsaved people and declaring to them that there are consequences for their life, for their actions. Now, why would God say that to people except they had the opportunity to not go in that direction in the first place? And if they just had, see, they have a propensity to sin, but they don't have to sin. I mean, I know, I know unsaved people that have never cheated on their wives, that love them with all of their heart, and treat their spouses and their children and are moral and ethical on their jobs more than some Christians are. So we all still have free will. Now, it won't get you saved. What gets you saved? Believing in Jesus as Lord and Savior. See, this is a problem where the world sees who are living certain lifestyles, and they may be good, but that doesn't save you. Amen? All of that, see, works won't get you to heaven. Matter of fact, uh, Isaiah said this in the first chapter. He said, all your righteousness, not your, not your bad deals, not your bad deeds. He said, but all of your righteousness is as filthy rags. So nobody could earn their way to God. All you could do is just...
just say thank you and receive the free gift. Now what we do now as Christians is a result of. And yes, our lifestyle as we yield to the Holy Spirit changes and our lifestyle becomes more unethical, but that doesn't make you any more saved or not saved. But here's these people in the Old Testament, and it says, our father's sins, they were in iniquity. Why was the reason for that? Well, look at the next verse. Verse 7 of Psalm 106. Our fathers understood not your wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of the mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Verse 13. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. Verse 21. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. So friends, listen, as New Testament Christians, we cannot afford to forget God's benefits. Why? Because it develops a thankful and a grateful heart of confidence and a focus on Almighty God and His goodness that positively affects our behavior. See, this is what happens when you preach grace. People say, well, if you just keep preaching grace, you're just giving people life, they're going to run out in sin. No, when you preach God's grace and His goodness and His mercy, you run to God. You don't want to do anything that discredits the Lord. Amen. You want to represent Him in the right way. Amen. Now go over to, go over to Romans chapter 6. You know, I want to say this to you. Romans chapter 5, actually Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 are probably some of the most powerful chapters in the Bible, in the New Testament, that edify and build you up. But when they are interpreted wrong, they can be preached as condemnation to you. That's right. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you this in Romans chapter 6, which is probably one of the most edifying and strengthening chapters in the whole New Testament to build you up, how it's been preached to tear you down instead. And I'm going to show you what the error is. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And see, this is, people came against Paul, just like they come against grace preachers today. See, you're just saying it's okay to live any way you want. Now watch. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? Know ye not that as many as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death. Now let's stop right here. So here's what the legalistic church says. They say, well, if you're a Christian, you, you can't be committing acts of sin. If you do, there's something wrong with you. You're discrediting God. You can't really be saved. Now wait a second. In this chapter here, any place except one place, and I'll show you where that is, Every place where you see sin in there, it's talking about the sin principle or the sin nature. It's not talking about the verb, the acts of sin, which is what people teach. And it brings people into <laughs> condemnation instead of bringing freedom. So what is Paul saying? He said, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we continue in sin when we've been delivered from it? How shall we continue in the sinful nature when we don't have a sinful nature anymore. So Paul is, is bringing freedom to people's lives. He said, listen, it's impossible for you to live in sin as a habitual lifestyle because that's not your nature anymore. He's not saying that you can never commit an act of sin anymore. And if you do, you're not really saying. He's not saying that. Now, I, I brought with me a Weiss translation. And Weiss is uh, something that gives you the closest to the New Testament Greek. And I just want to read these verses to you. What shall we say then? Shall we habitually sustain an attitude of dependence upon, yieldingness to, and cordiality with the sinful nature? See, anytime you see sin there, he's talking about the sinful nature, not the verb, an act of sin, which is what's been preached at us all our life. <laughs> with the sinful nature, in order that grace may abound. May such a thing never occur. How is it possible for us such persons as we are who have been separated once for all from the sinful nature any longer live in its grip. So Paul's saying, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to, to live in sin. Why? It's not your nature anymore. It's impossible for you to have a sinful nature anymore. Why? Because you don't have a sinful nature. Because when you got born again, Rome, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, God took out that old man and he put a new species of being that never existed anymore, that does not even crave or even have a, uh, an inclination towards sin. Go with me. Do you not know that all who were placed in Jesus Christ, in his death were placed? We therefore were entombed with him through his being placed in his death, 
in order that in the same manner as there was raised up Christ from among those who are dead through the glory of the Father, thus also we by means of a new life imparted may order our behavior. See, they had a propensity to sin. They were they, they had a sinful nature. They were born into iniquity. We were too, but we were taken out of iniquity. And we were taken out of that sinful nature the second, the moment we were born again. Amen? For in view of the fact that we are, are those who have become permanently united with Him with respect to the likeness of His death, certainly also we shall be those who, as a logical result, have become permanently united with Him with respect to the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this experientially, that our old unregenerate self was crucified once for all. Are you getting this? Once for all. With him, in order that the physical body, therefore dominated by the sinful nature, might be rendered inoperative in that respect, with the result that no longer we are in rendering a slave's habitual obedience to the sinful nature. The point I want you to see here, friends, and I don't want to read this whole thing, but in this chapter where you see over and over and over again sin, sin, sin. What does the church preach? Sin, sin, sin. Acts of sin, acts of sin. That's not what the New Testament, he's not talking about that. He's talking about your sinful nature. And when you realize you don't have a sinful nature anymore, and it's not your propensity to sin anymore. Now what do you do? You're not focused on sin anymore. You're focused on righteousness. Now you're focused on Almighty God. And you're not even considering sin anymore. Why? Because it's not your nature anymore. Amen? He forgives all our iniquities. Listen, friends, that's Old Covenant. He didn't just forgive all our iniquities. He took that iniquity out of there. He took that sinful nature out of there. It doesn't even exist anymore. Are y'all with me? Praise God. I thought you'd be happier than that. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says this, that Jesus is the express image of the Godhead in bodily form. Verse 10 of Colossians 2 says, And you are complete in Him. Amplified Bible says, And you too have come to fullness. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reaching full spiritual stature in you. So when, who, who are you? What are you in the realm of the Spirit? You're one with God. You're not God, but you're one with Him. He has joined Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with you. And your nature is now divine. This is not your nature. It's the house that you live in. Your mind, will, and emotions is not your nature. It's simply a part of your being, listen, that is being renewed. But your spirit, man, is your nature. And that nature has been changed. That old man, who you used to be, that person of iniquity, a propensity to sin, does not exist anymore. God took that out. So New Testament, He didn't just forgive your iniquity. He took iniquity that that part of your being out and doesn't even exist anymore. Now you are complete in Him. Now you are perfected in Him. Amen? It's good news, friends. Praise God. Colossians 3, 3 and 4. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, our life shall appear. Now, if you have a King James Bible, anybody have a King James version of the Bible? Colossians 3, 3 and 4. In your Bible, you will see when Christ, who is our life, appears. Now that word who is in italics. It means it's not in there. So what it says is this. When Christ, our life, appears. So what is your life? What is your born-again nature now? What is that new creation man? You can say it. It's okay. It's not blasphemy. Huh? It's Jesus. It's Christ. When Christ, our life, appears, then we shall appear with Him in glory. That's not the sweet by and by. That's right. The glory of the Lord, which is the makeup of our spirit, man, will be revealed when Christ is our life and we understand that we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. That I don't have a rebellious nature anymore. But I, I, was, I was born in iniquity, but I'm not anymore. Amen. I have a brand new nature that's one with Almighty God. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm going to close here. And now, now our whole aim and acts of sin, and acts of sin, is Romans 6.11. Reckon indeed yourself indeed to sin. Reckon indeed yourself indeed dead to 
the sinful nature. And now acts of sin won't be a problem anymore. You won't even be concerned. And you won't even be focused on that. Now go over to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to close. Because I want to deal with acts of sin. Because this is another thing that brings condemnation on people. And so we saw in the Old Testament that not only did God forgive all our iniquities, sin and the consequences of sin, but also in that same psalm, he said, as far as the east is from the west, so far I have removed your sins from you. Is that not what it says? Am I, am I speaking Hebrew or Greek today, or am I just speaking plain, you know, upstate New York language, just plain English? It's something you understand, right? All right, good. And if you're watching from France or, or Australia, wherever you're watching from, I hope it comes across clear in your language too. Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll look at, let's see where I want to go here. I think it's verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Watch. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of these things, can never, with those sacrifices that were offered here by your continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered. See, if the old covenant was right, it would still be it would still be enforced today, but it's not. Jesus would never have had to come if the old covenant was right. Amen? When I, when I say right, if it, could, if it could do what God wanted it to do, which was change our nature, it couldn't do that. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin you have no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book to do your will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin you would not, neither had pleasure therein which had offered by the law. So God had no pleasure in anything that was going on that what the law did. It was temporary. It was the point to Jesus Christ. It was the point to their sinful nature. But now that we are in the New Testament, God took that law, nailed it to the cross, abolished it, and now it's the gospel of grace for saved and unsaved. Amen. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. See, people today are still, they still have in the Jewish culture, they still have the, 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 the Levitical, rabbinical priesthood. And they're still doing works of the law. You ever see them? They wear those books on their heads. And, you know, they, they do this all the time. They're saying all these long prayers. And, I, and again, I'm not, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just telling you a fact. But it can go into any, any other race of anybody else that's trying to earn or merit or pray hard enough and long enough to try to be right with God. Can't do it. Now watch. Verse 12. By this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins. Say one sacrifice for sins. What's the next word? <clears throat> huh? Okay. Uh, for all times, uh, New American Standard? Forever. Forever. King James.